there were a few comments that really actually touched my heart. Um, some comments were saying that they felt like the the film was about uh, trans, um, how the cat thinks it's a dog and wants to find acceptance from the boy. And I never thought of it that way, like I, but I thought that was beautiful. It was sort of a personal piece. Growing up, I didn't have any friends until I was in fourth grade. And I wanted to find somebody who accepted me for who I was. And I was sort of an oddball growing up. And um, so the cat is sort of like me. And to hear some comments of people saying, wow, this cat is like representing trans and um, about the acceptance of that. And I thought, I thought that was beautiful. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment about the episode. And if you're watching on Spotify or listening on a traditional podcast platform, please follow, rate us five stars, and leave a review if you would be so kind. Thank you. Welcome to the Way to Know You podcast, season two, episode 29. My name is Nick Rounds, and I will be your host. My next guest is the founder and president of Grayscale Animation, a 2D animation studio creating characters from the heart. Though she's originally from the tech industry, she chased after her personal passion for animation to create Odd Dog, Grayscale's first short animated film. After a successful Kickstarter in 2017, the film premiered in 2019 and won multiple film festival awards. And today, Grayscale is in the process of completing their next film, Orin's Way. More on that later. Keika Lee, wait, I know you. How are you today? Good. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, so excited to tear into this because honestly, uh, you and I used to work together a long, long time ago, but your journey into animation is relatively recent and I've never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you about it. So I'm actually really excited to talk about all this stuff with you. So thank you. <laughs> um, but before we kick into all of everything grayscale, talk about odd dog, talk about Orin's way. Um, I want to talk about what started this journey for you specifically. So um, to set some context, which I already have, but uh, let's talk about your background professionally and some of your passions. Um, can you talk about what your professional journey has been in the tech industry? Oh, um, so yeah, it's been a long journey. Um, I actually started out in let me start out actually in college. In college, I studied 2D animation. Um, I was going to be an animator, but I ended up getting an internship at Electronic Arts on the Return of the King game, the console game. And that was super exciting, you know, right out of college, getting that internship. And I was part of the storyboard team, um, helping them out as sort of an assistant. And um, I kind of fell in love with production which is interesting. Um, a lot of people are like production, <laughs> but um, I really loved the being able to organize and schedule and help artists. And um, it became a passion of mine. So I stuck, I, I, be, I um, decided to just follow that path. And um, from there I uh, got into, um, I stayed at EA for a couple of years and became a production coordinator. And then I made it into uh, DreamWorks Animation after that as a production coordinator and um, worked on a few films there like uh, Shrek 3 and Madagascar 2. And I decided to try my hand at live action and went to a small boutique studio, effects studio called The Orphanage. Um, which uh, is no longer around now, but um, it was it was pretty big at the time. Um, it was in the Presidio next to ILM, and they did a lot of great movies. And um, I worked on um, Live Free, Die Hard, and uh, nice. Iron Man. Um, it was pretty awesome. It was a great experience. So I worked on that for a year, and I came back to DreamWorks Animation and 
was the production supervisor of the modeling team there um, and worked on Megamind, which was another great project. Um, it, it was it was super cool because uh, I got to see a lot of great artists just pull together and make this film happen. And it was our first superhero film, superhero, supervillain film, which was uh, exciting for the company. Um, and that's when I decided, oh, well, let me try my hand at um, tech. So I, that's when Zynga started becoming big. And uh, that's where you and I met. Um, so I got to Zynga and I started there on the game Mafia Wars. And um, never heard of it. Just <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's where I was just like, what is this? This is so cool. Um, social gaming. Like it was the new thing. Um, it was interesting because you know, growing up, I always played console games. And here I thought console games were it. That's the way games were going to be played. But then all of a sudden social games came and you're playing on your phone. And people who are not gamers became gamers, but didn't know that they were gamers. And yep. it, it just revolutionized the game industry. So it was really awesome to be a part of that uh, revolution. And um, so you and I met on Mafia Wars and I was an art producer on that team. And uh, then Zynga wanted to try a 3D game called Ma Farmville 2. And that's where I uh, helped out on that team with uh, my background in 3D, 3D animated films and um, decided to try my hand in that. And after that, um, Actually, so Farmville 2 and Mafia Wars were on Facebook. So it was not mobile at the time. It was more of a Facebook game. Right, um, flash so let me let me re rewind there. Um, so um, it, it revolutionized uh, social gaming. Yeah. So then um, after that, I decided, I saw that the game industry was changing again to mobile games. And so from there, I went to Gree uh, to help them out with their mobile games there that they've been uh, working on. And then I went to um, a free to play game at EA Maxis uh, that they were working on. It was an undisclosed project that never took off because unfortunately Maxis ended up closing down. Um, and then I made it to Machine Zone and uh, stayed at Machine Zone for a couple of years on their Game of War franchise and helped out on their Final Fantasy XIII franchise. Nice. Mm -hmm. You rattled off a couple of things I want to go back to. Um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the internship over Electronic Arts, working in Return of the King. Um, I think as an intern, when you're fresh from college and you don't know the industry and everything is new and shiny and scary to you, um, what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned early in an internship that like either really stuck with you or like some realizations of just like actually being there, making the game or being part of it? Like what are some of the biggest revelations to you there? Oh God, that's a good question. Oh, you know, my internship there was just so fun and I felt like, like you said, I was fresh. I had fresh eyes and I felt like it was my playground. <laughs> so, That's awesome. Um, I was very like casual with everyone, open with everyone. Everybody knew me. And um, I was helping out the art director doing rounds. And um, I, I learned a lot from that team. Uh, I think I learned a lot about professionalism. I learned about um, how to network, um, I learned how to um, just be myself, you know, and be true to myself and always, uh, no matter what, just go for it. Um, and yeah, it was just an ama amazing experience. Like, I remember um, the executive producer was just such an awesome guy and he really knew what he wanted for the game and the vision. And um, 
it was kind of interesting because some, I think some people are intimidated by him, but for me, I was just very like, hey there, you know, how are you? And, <laughs> and um, he, I think he appreciated that. And um, some, and I would just be like, hey, nice pants. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh my goodness, thank you for saying that. Cause my wife doesn't like them. <laughs> that's hilarious yeah but yeah it was it was a awesome experience (laughs) anybody that knows you knows you that you're one of the most warm welcoming bubbly friendly people in the world so that absolutely (laughs) checks out so go through the search um you've never told me nice pants but i wear the same pants (laughs) you would have no reason to um (laughs) <laughs> another another thing that you touched on as well is console games. Uh, you mentioned that you you love console games and that that was like the peak of gaming for you. Um, I'm curious, what consoles did you have and what were some of your favorite games that you played when you were younger? Oh, God. So my first console game, my first console was, of course, the first Nintendo. Um, and my favorite, and I had, of course, the Sega Genesis. And, but my favorite was the PlayStation, um, PlayStation one and PlayStation two. Um, those are my favorite consoles. And I felt like PlayStation just, it, it just blew my mind at the time. Like it just, the games were like steps above what like Nintendo and Sega were doing. And it was just simply amazing. I loved it. Were there any like super notable favorite games of yours that you still think about or like that you remember playing a ton of? Oh yeah. Um, Final Fantasy VIII. Um, that was the Final Fantasy that got me into the franchise. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then also with Megamind, um, I think it's interesting uh, to have you be in the trenches and like um, see that team like really dig in and um make make the film happen i guess was there any specific examples that are not um (laughs) gonna violate an nda uh that is general enough to explain like the tenacity tenacity of the team or like their work ethic um that kind of shows like behind the scenes like how hard artists work to get stuff done sometimes oh god um yeah that's right i'm not sure i can say much okay about the project that's fine i just want to see i was trying to dig to see if there's anything anything else interesting there wait wait there there is a story that i might be able to talk about there was this one time that we had to uh (laughs) we had to um adjust you know the characters like there's megamind there's metro man there's yeah yeah so Metro Man's the hero, the good guy. And Metro Man apparently needed his package adjusted. So the uh, the model, we had to bring the model into the meeting and adjust his <laughs> package. So I had to actually say on the intercom, Metro Man package, adu- package reduction meeting happening now in room 210. <laughs> That is incredible. (laughs) (laughs) The fact that people got paid money to sit in a room and stare at uh, cartoon junk (laughs) together professionally for a work meeting is kind of amazing. I love that. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of amazing animation, there's been really amazing new animation in recent years. Uh, a lot of stuff out of Netflix and, um, both anime style and everything else. And, um, of course we always have our old favorites. Uh, Mm -hmm. so what are, and knowing that like you have this tech background, but also obviously there is always animation is what you went to school for. And then also something you've always been passionate about. Um, so what are some films and animated works that still stick with you and possibly inspired some of your work at Grayscale? Oh man. Um, there's so many, but, um, if I had to choose definitely Cinderella, Disney Cinderella from 
the 1940s, 30s, 40s. Um, that was my true inspiration for even getting into the industry. Um, and anything from the 90s, uh, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, um, the those three for sure. Um, I just absolutely love Aladdin the most because Aladdin's line work, the clean line work of thin to thick to thin really inspired Odd Dog. And um, well, not just that, but I also was inspired by Korean calligraphy, how it swoops like that um, for Odd Dog. Um, other animated favorites that I was inspired by, of course, Miyazaki films. Um, his films are just simply amazing and simple stories and um, inspiring. Um, I was also inspired by uh, Inuyasha um, by Rumiko Takahashi. Uh, she, it's a famous anime um, that was made in the 90s as well or 2000s. I don't know. Yeah. I think so. Uh yeah. Yeah, I think it really popular in like the early 2000s, but I think it started yeah. in the late 90s, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, another anime called uh, Ruroni Kenshin that's actually being rebooted now. Um, but Kenshin came out in the 90s as well, I think. Uh, yeah, but really excited about the reboot. <laughs> Get hype. Yeah. Um, is, uh, so what about... Cinderella like what elements of it and what what about Miyazaki films like really stick with you like you mentioned the line work of, of Aladdin are there any elements from Cinderella or a Miyazaki film that like the essence of it or like just the decisions that were made what are the things that really stick with you so with Cinderella Cinderella was actually the first Disney feature film I ever watched and after I watched it I asked what was that and I want to do it and um, I actually watched that film so many times I watched it over and over I watched it frame by frame I slow mowed that VHS tape so many times just to see every frame of that film and I tried to draw it um, it was not so much the style but it was also because it was a princess film like sort of princess um it was about an underdog who was trying to break free of her her prison you know and make her dreams come true and that really resonated with me um when it comes to Miyazaki films I really respect that he keeps it simple he doesn't care about character designs he doesn't care about I feel like he doesn't care about pleasing you. He wants to do things himself. Like he's like, I'm going to make this because I like it. And if you like it, that's cool. You know, um, the films have this character design. That's like Miyazaki. That's a Miyazaki film and the colors, color palette, line work, everything is just, it calls, it says it has his brand and um, movies like Spirited Away, which is one of my favorites, uh, really inspired me um, when I was uh, visual de visually developing the forest of Orange Way, um, just the magical feel and some of the colors there. That's awesome. Um, the thing that always sticks with me about any Studio Ghibli film, uh, you mentioned like really touching and like inspiring films. I mean, there's no bigger heart crusher than Grave of the Fireflies. Um, there's nothing more fun and lighthearted than Kiku's Delivery Service. But uh, I think that the funniest thing is in Howl's Moving Castle, just like the food, like the food looks so delicious like it's animated you're like that looks amazing i want that right now why can't i have that but yeah <laughs> honestly i think that's a staple of a lot of anime is like a lot of anime like makes food look really really good <laughs> it does i mean and it's like food anime <laughs> yeah like it's not that important to the story usually unless it's like uh i don't know like a focus around a chef or something but 
when they take that extra time and care of actually like making the food look really good it's just it's kind of a funny added like note because like it could just be simple like background like line work like a lot of america like the simpsons it's usually like they're pushing around like just mush on a plate whereas like <laughs> you have the most amazing bubbling like uh you know bowl of hot pot you could ever see like mm -hmm. bubbling away but good times mm -hmm. um so uh building on that further uh wearing different hats now um mm -hmm. as a creative as just a enjoyer of animation which you've kind of already answered as a mom which i think is also an added thing uh specifically uh, you have a son, and what are some of your favorite thing, like animated things, to watch with your son that you oh. that you both enjoy? Oh wow! So I really enjoy watching animated movies with my son. I'm actually, I love watching movies about uh, kids, like kids um, reaching their goal, reaching their dreams. It's inspiring. Um, like my son's favorite, one of his favorite animated films is Big Hero 6. And, oh. oh, I love that film. It's so good. And it, it's just so, so it has a positive message. And um, I really appreciate that. And that there's something, there's a movie like that, that he can relate to. Um, also, my son's half Asian, and you know the Hiro Hamada is Asian, and he can relate to that character, so it's really cool that way too. Um, yeah, so we watch a lot of those films, and he likes films about animals, so he likes Madagascar, um, he likes Totoro, um, he. So we have a lot of fun watching animated films. Uh, we when we laugh a lot it's really cool that's awesome yeah big hero 6 is probably one of my favorite uh movies that came out like animated movies that came out in recent years like that wreck it ralph the, the first one like oh, but yeah. baymax and like the the drama of big hero 6 is actually like really intense uh mm -hmm. i was impressed at like how intense that story got and like how high the stakes were just for like a simple story because you, you see it like you see the trailer and you see like Baymax is obviously like the 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 butt of the joke for everything that he's just like a, a little cute inflatable robot. But then how Baymax is introduced into the movie itself and like the stakes of him of, you know, a tragedy and then the introduction mm -hmm. of Baymax afterwards is like a pretty interesting way to cut the tension of sorrow and kind mm -hmm. of distract you from it, but also not sweep it under the rug. Um, yeah. Yeah, I really like that movie for sure. Yeah. Try not to get choked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we talked a lot about other stuff, other things that inspired you. Um, but let's kick into your stuff. Let's talk about Odd Dog and Grayscale Animation. Um, so what inspired you to create Odd Dog? And um, what inspired you to, to kick off the journey, which is Grayscale Animation? So Odd Dog, Odd Dog actually started Grayscale Animation. Usually it's the other way around. People start the company and then start making content. But it was Odd Dog that started Grayscale. Um, after I uh, left Machine Zone, I started drawing again, uh, which I hadn't done in many years. And I started just drawing cartoons of a little boy and his cat, which was based off of my son and our cat, Obi. And Obi's an interesting cat because he is, acts dog-like. Um, so that's how Odd Dog was born. It was really easy. It was like based on my life. So um, my son and Obi, they're like best friends. Like ever since my son was born, Obi has been stuck to him like gum. It's the cutest thing ever. And so when I was drawing little cartoons of them, I thought, you know, it'd be fun if there was an animation of them. And then it just sparked this idea where, and this passion inside me where I was like, 
what happened to that idea that I wanted to have my own animation studio? Like, whatever happened to that want, that motivation? Like, that was the whole point. That was the whole point of going to art school and becoming an animator before I like got into production. And then I thought, why can't I make an animation studio? Like, I could do it. <laughs> so, so then I just started asking friends, hey, do you know a storyboard artist? Hey, do you know an animator? Hey, do you know a character de designer? And then all of a sudden, people started like sh showing up and they liked my idea. They, they said, sure, I'll help. And I got a great character. I got a great storyboard artist who uh, looked at my script because, I, and I didn't even know how to write a script. My first script looked like a shopping list. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, it looked hideous. And <laughs> I cannot believe my story artist actually took it and drew off of it because if I was her, I would have been like, what is this girl doing? But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, she took my script and she did a great job on a storyboard of a five minute, 10 minute piece, actually. It was going to be a 10 minute short. And then it was cut down to five. And then I got a good friend of mine, um, Genevieve Sai, she's an amazing character designer and she offered to do the character design of the cat a year. Nice. <laughs> she offered to yeah. do this character design of the cat and she did an incredible job. Incredible. Like the cat just blows everybody away. Um, and, yeah, uh, Genevieve is an, an amazing artist, and I think she's yeah. currently working for uh, Warner Studios. Oh, she's at DreamWorks now. At DreamWorks. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 She's great. Sorry, that's what and it was. DreamWorks. Super yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah, because she worked um, on the reboot of Animaniacs, which is super awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and then I just started getting all these friends and friends of friends to work on this, and it was baby steps. I I can't emphasize enough to people that you can make your dream and goals come true if you don't overwhelm yourself by looking at it as, oh my God, this big thing, I cannot do this. I looked at it as, okay, here's this big thing. I'm just going to take it step by step, step by step. And it took two years. It took two years to make, but I did it. And I did it with a great team who I am immensely grateful for. And it's an incredible piece. To this day, I still get comments where people say it's, it's an amazing film that was nicely executed and it speaks to them. I've had, it's touching. It's touching to hear what people say about it. So with your production background, um, how do you think that helped you out immensely with just organizing everything? Because you mentioned earlier that like, you kind of fell in love with production and helping people and, and organizing things, being kind of the ringleader of the animation circus. Uh, how did your production background come to play? Oh, uh, I think it helped a lot. Um, you, you definitely need to be organized and have the diplomacy and have the um, professionalism and what else goes with production. Um, follow through, I guess, but all all roles have follow through. Um, it definitely helped. And with production, with my production background, I got to see all er all areas of the process of making a game or making a film. So I had a lot of insight into that. And 
I was able to understand and preemptively know how to communicate with each artist. So I think that was really helpful. When you say preemptively communicate, um, what do you mean that, by that specifically, I guess? Well, I approached it with empathy. Um, mm. I approached everybody with empathy. Like, I think that is missing a lot um, in, in leadership um, from my experience. Um, each person has their own way of doing their art, their own way of doing their job. And you need to think about, well, why? And what context do they need? And what is frustrating them? Um, what do they need from me? And that's what I try to approach them with. And preemptively is what, that's what I mean, the, the empathy. Gotcha. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, that's actually really interesting. And I think that's a, that's a, a really important soft skill that I think a lot of people kind of take for granted is meeting the person where they are and mm -hmm. um, helping them on the journey to get the job done, but also making sure that they're enjoying the actual work itself and that they're not just mm -hmm. pulling their hair out or being super frustrated. So that's a super rare quality to call out that that's super important. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, you mentioned writing scripts. Um, is there any other like huge challenges that you immediately kind of were like, oh God, <laughs> I can't believe I have to deal with this in terms of like juggling your own indie project? Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you had to face? Oh man, um, fundraising is a big challenge. Um, it's always tough to ask for money. I mean, it's, yeah, it's always tough. Um, but you got to do it. You have to raise funds. You have to have the money to make the film somehow, right? And you have to put yourself out there. And me being an introvert, um, I no, really, I am. <laughs> I, does that does that mean you're an introvert with batteries that you're very animated at work, but then at home you're like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess pretty much. But I it's hard for me to just be out there and be like, Hey, like I'm making this film and you got to give me money. <laughs> it's really tough. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I totally get it. I mean, just with like with anything, like the business side of art is always a thing that can be tricky because some people are really good at the business side and they're not great at the art side or vice versa, or maybe the business side doesn't feel great or it feels gross sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it just depends on the situation, but yeah, that's capitalism for you. But at the same time, art is super important and making important works of art that make you feel something, God forbid, is super important, obviously, because those early films that you mentioned earlier, like the, you know, those are all things that still stick with us. They're an important part of the zeitgeist of our consciousness. And, exactly. you know, if somebody had not taken the time to make those films, we wouldn't be inspired to make our, our own films. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think you brought up a good point about business side. Um, wearing many hats. Um, I do the creative, I do the business, I do the, I sometimes do the marketing, I, it, it's a lot. And I think the business side is the toughest for me. So building on that. <laughs> You, <laughs> sl you slam dunked Og Dog. It exists. It's real. People have seen it. It's won awards. Um, and you're in the process of working on Orin's Way, which is uh, a pretty big undertaking compared to Odd Dog because Odd Dog mm -hmm. is a relatively simple story and Orin's Way is much more of a traditional fairy tale. Um, so what are some of the learnings that you've incorporated in Orin's Way, knowing that knowing what you went through with Odd Dog? Oh, Gosh, Orin's Way, you're right, is a bigger undertaking. Um, first off, it's 15 minutes as opposed to five minutes. Second, it's in color, um, whereas Odd Dog was black and white. <laughs> so that was a huge difference. Um, 
I had to also hire a bigger team. Um, could not do this on with a smaller team. So there's a lot more people to juggle, um, a lot more shots to juggle. So I had to hire a producer um, before I did everything. I was the producer, director, writer. This time I'm focusing more on directing and art directing. And I hired a producer to be on board with me. Um, it was just too much. Um, but yeah, it, and also uh, with Odd Dog, the script only took, I think, three to six months to write. And for Oren's Way, the script took a year to write. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. I guess related to that, um, <clears throat> so knowing that Oren's Way is a pretty, sorry, uh, knowing that Odd Dog is a pretty simple, straightforward story, whereas Oren's Way is like, you know, lore, fairy tale, magical fox, like a lot of stuff is going on. Um, what are some of the narrative challenges that you faced? And given the fact that it took you a year to write it? First off, Orange Way was, uh, the story was by me, but it was the screenplay was written by Anna Thorup, my writer. Um, I really, this time I needed a writer to help me. Um, and one of the challenges was that this was a three act uh, story, whereas Odd Dog was just, <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, and Oren's Way originally had more characters. And I realized uh, closer to production start date that the we should cut the character, a couple of characters out because they were just complicating the story and um, simplifying the story would have just made the short cleaner, um, but that'll probably be in the deleted scenes section or something. Um, there was also at some point we were gonna have dialogue, but I wanted to keep to just having the opening prologue be a storybook opening with the tapestries explaining the lore of the magical fox um, and then the rest of the film is non-dialogue my biggest reason for doing that is because i want the film to be shown the film is going to be shown all over the world like i submit to film festivals all over the world and i want it to be enjoyed with i want it to be enjoyed with everyone i don't want it to be like um, I don't want it to be oh, what's the word uh, alienating or um, yeah yeah polarizing yeah alienating I think that's the word alienating like people just because they can't speak English you know um, that's the reason oh which is uh, what inspired the name grayscale animation grayscale comes from uh, silent films um, I love silent films because you can watch them with no dialogue and have a great time watching them um, and still understand what's going on. Anyways, um, so Oren's Way has um, no dialogue because of that. And uh, I think that's, that's it. Do you have any favorite silent films? Just out of curiosity of a film nerd. Oh, <laughs> I love Charlie Chaplin. I absolutely love him. I know he's mainstream silent film person, but I just absolutely adore him. And I watched, I think I watched every one of his films. And I tried to, when I was younger, I tried to dig up even films that he, that were no longer available. Like I tried to look, look for them. Nice. Uh, do you have any notable favorites that really stick with you? I actually like Payday. Hmm. Um, yeah, that one was really funny to me. <laughs> nice. Modern Times is my favorite. Um, and as a Bay Area native, uh, the Tramp holds a special place in my heart because the end of the Tramp is, um, it was shot in Niles, which is in Fremont, California. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, be, uh, Bronco Billy, the famous silent silent film cowboy, and um, uh, 
the film the film company I think it was S and E Studios or something like that. Oh. Um, they had filmed the Tramp and they had used Niles Canyon as like the ending for that. But they had done a lot of films oh, over in, in Fremont, California. Yeah, there's like a little tiny silent film museum in Fremont, California. If you didn't know, that's great. Oh my god! And oh, one more. I actually also like the Vagabond. Mm. Oh, that's a good one too. That's actually my um, grandfather's favorite too. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so Orin's Way is not out yet. It's still in, in process, but Odd Dog mm-hmm. is out. And uh, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but people have had some some pretty interesting reactions to Odd Dog. Uh, what are some of your favorites? Because um, to me as a creative, I think one of the most um, rewarding slash uh, <laughs> slash things that you're most fearful of is just people's reactions to your work for better mm-hmm. or worse. But if they have a reaction, it's usually a good thing. Um, what are some of your favorite reactions that people have had to odd dog? My favorite reactions. Um, well, of course, children have the cutest reactions. A um, couple of questions I, I, I got from kids was why is the cat blue? You know, like, but then I get that a lot from YouTube comments as well. Like, why is the cat blue? <laughs> and I just have to say, oh, my favorite color. <laughs> um, not really. It was just, um, this happened to be blue. <laughs> but, um, and then uh, at one of our premiere, premiere screenings, um, another kid said, asked, asked, why was the cat snoring? because of course he's snoring at the beginning of the film. Um, I thought that was a cute question. Um, On YouTube, there were a few comments that really actually touched my heart. Um, Some comments were saying that they felt like the, the film was about uh, trans, Um, how the cat, thinks it's a dog and wants to find acceptance from the boy. And I never thought of it that way. Like I, 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 but I thought that was beautiful. I actually thought that was beautiful. Um, My intention for the film was actually about a cat that thinks it's a dog or believes he's a dog because you know that's what he wants to be and he wants to find that person that accepts him for who he is and it was sort of a personal piece because I wanted to growing up I didn't have any friends until I was in fourth grade and I wanted to find somebody who accepted me for who I was and I was sort of an oddball growing up and um, so the cat is sort of like me. And to hear some comments of people saying, wow, this cat is like representing trans and um, about the acceptance of that. And I thought, I thought that was beautiful. That's amazing. I love that. Um, I, yeah, that's one of the things I love about music too. Uh, well, just any art in general is like the way that people will interpret your work or any work in their own personal way and add meaning to it that maybe you didn't have context about, or maybe you didn't see it that way. Um, so that's really awesome. But I mean, that just shows that the human experience is layered and it's beautiful that people can find meaning and stuff um, that you didn't mean for them to, but if it relates, then it relates. And that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and for your personal stories as well. I just, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you name drop Genevieve. You mentioned your writer. <laughs> yeah, you worked with an amazing creative and individuals to help you complete your films. Um, so can you talk about some of the people that have, you've collaborated with and how they've helped you grow as a creative and made you an even strong leader, stronger leader? Oh wow! Um, so Odd Dog had some uh, pretty awesome advisors. Um, we had. Gary Trousdale, who was the director of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, and uh, he watched Odd Dog 
when it was an animatic storyboard animatic and he gave uh, some feedback on it, um, which I thought was incredible. Like it was an amazing experience, um, like bucket list experience. <laughs> and um, we also had uh, Craig Kelman um, help out with a couple of character designs. C Craig Kelman was the one of the art directors for Powerpuff Girls. Nice. And um, he also did Foster's Home for, what was it? Foster's Home for, I forgot. Um, I, can, I can look it up. But he was also the character designer for Madagascar and uh, Hotel Transylvania. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I always forget the rest of it because it's such a long title. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, most people just call it Fosters or Fosters Homes. Um, yeah. You, uh, was there any specific, what kind of specific feedback to the, sorry, I'm forgetting his name, the Beauty and the Beast guy? Oh, Gary Townsdale. Name? Thank you. Uh, what kind of specific feedback did he give? I'm just out of curiosity. Oh, he gave some great feedback, um, which, is subtle but sweet um so in the film odd dog in the film odd dog he um after he tells the cat to sit and the cat sits the boy then looks at his hand and then realizes Oh, the cat can do tricks. There's that moment. That wasn't that moment wasn't in there. Um, until Gary told me to put it in there. He said it, it actually just went from the boy told the cat to sit and then starts just telling the cat to do tricks. So it just went straight into that. But Gary said, no, put a pause where the boy looks at his hand and realizes oh the cat can do tricks and it just sweetened the story and i was just like how do you do that you're a magic man like, <laughs> it, it was just amazing like yeah it really the timing was perfect i think that's one of the most important reasons to go back and watch the films of the greats in general of like all the decisions that they make like that, that most people will take for granted. But if you actually pay attention to like, oh, it's not just plot of, okay, this happens, this happens, this happens. It's also, here's a story of this character is trying to get over this obstacle. They get over the obstacle and they learn something new and they're changed because of it. And that is a change moment. That is a, I understand what, what I can do now and what I can, what this cat's relationship to me is differently how, how it's changed our relationship together um mm -hmm. yeah that's that's amazing mm -hmm. yeah and any any living legend like that any insight that they can give like that is invaluable so that's that's amazing mm -hmm. um so what's your current take on the animation landscape both as a consumer and also as a uh independent you know, animation studio, like what are, what are some of the things that like your general take on the animation um, industry right now, as it stands? I think, I think there's, I think 2D is making a comeback. There is so much, there's so many great things happening with 2D and a lot of um, great technology happening with 2D, such as uh, the movie Klaus. Um, when I saw that film, I was like, is that 3D? No, it's 2D. Like that movie was hand drawn and they just did something with the rendering that made it look 3D. But that movie just blew me away. And there's films like Promare, by Studio Trigger. Uh, the opening of Promare just is incredible. The camera work and the layout of it, it 
everything about it was um, technically technically challenging. Um, I just believe that it's going to get better, um, especially with the way technology is moving forward. Um, and 2D is just going to get better because of it. Uh, right now, and hand-drawn animation is, though it's like old, um, old school and um, the way things were done way back when, it's also very much respected. Um, everybody looks at it as, wow, that, that is animation. That is where everything started. And that is what you have to learn before you can become really good at the stuff that is out there right now. Yeah, I remember seeing, um, going to the Walt Disney uh, Museum in the Presidio, right? In mm -hmm. San Francisco. And seeing the actual machine that they used uh, for making the animation cells and seeing like how it was layered. Because I've always seen animation mm -hmm. cells, but I'd never actually seen the way that they layered it. And I thought that was really fascinating, but it's something you kind of take for granted just, you know, back in the day, like um, the sheer amount of artists that it took to make one animated film and like how many years of their life, how many hours of hard work. And um, obviously with technology, it saves us a lot of time, but those are masters. And the fact that you can go back and pick up even just a single cell of animation or a single scratch piece of paper that they use for the roughs and sketches like the that stuff is all historic at this point and just incredible to look at because like when you see cinderella on a page or you see snow white or beauty and the beat or not being well yeah some beauty and the beast um you know it's incredible to look at so mm -hmm. um so being besides funding <laughs> um what are some other aspects of the animation industry that like people have to navigate if you're inside of it? Like, what are, what are some of the things that like you had to, um, kind of learn the hard way about in terms of like, I have to actually step up and do this. Um, you mentioned marketing earlier as well, I guess. Is there any other things that like, um, that you didn't realize at first that you're like, I have to get really good at this or like really dive into it in terms of like animation specifically? Yeah, um, so I have the production background, but I don't have the art director and animation director background, obviously. Like, I don't have that on my resume, but I went to school for it. And, you know, some people might be like, oh, you went to school with the art. But, <laughs> but then... At the same time, I know what I want and I have a strong vision. And um, I just put up my sleeves and I went into it and I was like, for this background, I want this color, this color, this color. Here are my reference photos. Here is the sketch, you know, cause I still know how to draw. And I just went all in like, you can't be scared. You you have to do it. Even if it's chicken scratches that you can only do, just show what you want and be clear about what you want. And the people that are around you who have the strength to finish what you want to start will finish it strong, right? So that's something I learned a long time ago. And I brought with me is that you're not going to be the best at everything but and that's okay like you're going to find people who are super good and you're going to be able to ask them to help you so that's why when I did doodles of the my son and his cat I knew I had to get a storyboard artist to do the storyboards I couldn't do it on my own I needed somebody to who was better than me to like carry out that vision. And um, so that was a really big learning experience for me. 
It can always be intimidating or scary to kind of share what's in your head and in your heart with other people. But they say, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. And if you want to go far, go together. And I think you've gone pretty far. Yeah. And it's, it's been amazing to, to like, seriously, in all honesty, like I've been really inspired um, from a distance being a creep uh, <laughs> at your <laughs> inc incredible work with animation. And I love that you're pursuing this and I think it's so awesome. So um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing about your journey, your insights and everything like that. Um, is there anything that you would like to plug before we leave social media sites, cool things happen in your life? Um, so yeah, we're on um, Facebook and Instagram as Grayscale Animation. Uh, we're on Twitter at Grayscale Anim. And we do have a donation page. <laughs> I will make um, that's in the link of description. Is it, is it coffee or Kofi? I would never have known uh, to say that. It's, a, it's pronounced coffee. Okay. Coffee.com slash Grayscale Animation. I will make sure that's in the link. Of the <laughs> yeah. Cause you. you, cause you did a successful, another successful uh, Kickstarter for orange for orange way, but mm -hmm. there's a lot more uh, stuff to cover financially. And so a tip jar is a great way to help you out to uh, slam dunk the movie into uh, mm -hmm. the final form. So yeah, we're yeah. just a few months away. Super exciting. <laughs> I'll make sure that's in the link of the description. Well, Keika, Thank you so, so much for sharing so much about your work, um, about your life and experience. Um, it was really great to talk to you and catch up. Thank you for having me. It was an honor. Everybody else, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time.